In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, verses 52 and 53, we have a strange little passage about when Jesus died. Not only do you have darkness and an earthquake, but you have the tombs opening up, and it said the spirits of many saints were raised, and after the resurrection they came out, walked into Jerusalem, and appeared to many. This is only told by Matthew of the four Gospels. So what are we to do with this? A lot of commentators don't really mention this or want to spend a lot of time with it. I think what's going on here, when you look at the Greco-Roman and Jewish literature of the period, that would seem to suggest that Matthew does not mean for us to understand these in a historical sense, but he wants us to see these as what we would call as portents. When Julius Caesar died, there were a number of uh, ancient authors who reported that there was a comet, that Mount Etna erupted, and all kinds of things were seen, that pale phantoms were seen walking around at sunset, that streams stopped flowing, black intestines were seen outside of cattle. Now most of them just talk about a comet, uh, eclipse of the sun, but Virgil, who is writing, writing in poetic form, mentioned all these other things. Right before the temple was destroyed, Josephus reports that a number of portents happened. There was a comet that um, the gates of the Jerusalem temple, which took more than 20 men to open, open by themselves. And um, this is very similar to what we find another ancient author, I believe it's Cassius Dio, who says that when Caesar went to Egypt, that the, a number of portents happened, one of them being that the gates of the temple of Jupiter, which took many men to open, opened by themselves. In a number of these kinds of accounts, we find that fighting was seen in the heavens. Sometimes even bloody weapons fell to the earth. We find comets, eclipses of the sun, darkness. Again, we find in Virgil about pale phantoms walking around at sunset. So it makes us wonder if what Matthew is doing is more of the same here. Portents are always mentioned when an event of cosmic, even divine significance is said to have taken place. Um, it might be something that we have similar today when we say 9-11 was an earth-shaking event. We're not meaning to communicate that um, the earth actually shook, that there was a giant earthquake felt around the world on 9-11. It's a figure of speech. It's a portent. Or when we say it rained cats and dogs, um, we're not really meaning that it rained cats and dogs. Um, Josephus reports that just before the temple was destroyed that a cow gave birth to a lamb. So we have to wonder whether these things were actually intended to be interpreted in this sense. So that's one thing that might cast doubt or give us reason to think that Matthew did not mean this in a literal historical sense. Another thing we have to take into consideration is the theology of this. So if these saints were raised at Jesus' death, were they raised in the same kind of body to die again, like Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, and the widow's son? Or were they raised in resurrection bodies? If they were raised in resurrection bodies, then we've got a little challenge here because Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 says, Christ is the first fruits of those who sleep. In other words, he's the first to be raised with a resurrection body. If that's the case, then Matthew is contradicting Paul here. The other option is that they're raised more like Lazarus, uh, in the same kind of body that will die again. But in this case, think about it, they're raised at Jesus' death. They don't come out of their tombs until more than 36 hours, 40 hours later. So now they're hungry, they're thirsty, and they're homeless. They're walking around in Jerusalem. Um, who are these people? Uh, when they ask questions, what's going on here? Uh, you know, someone says, man, are, are you drunk or something? You, you say you lived in the days of Solomon? What are you doing here now? Uh, they might have some interesting near-death experiences, but we barely even hear about these raised saints again. And sometimes when the early church fathers mentioned the phenomena at Jesus' death, such as the earthquake and darkness, they don't mention the raised saints. Why is that? Um, you say, well, what about the other phenomena? Well, we can look at those and, and think that maybe those are the same thing as well. Maybe that these are here just to portents to emphasize the death of the Son of God has occurred. And we have reason to think that maybe some 
could be commingled, historical details with these portents. John Ramsey has written a catalog of comets in the Greco-Roman literature, I believe at uh, 5th century BC through the 4th century. And in there, he lists all these mention of comets in the Greco-Roman literature. Many times these are used as portents. And some occasions you'll find them ma mentioned even alongside of an eclipse of the sun. Well, we can verify in some of these cases that a comet was actually present, such as uh, Halley's Comet or the hale -Bopp Comet would have been one of the ones mentioned in the literature. But NASA also has a website whereby you can go and enter a year and click on a geographical region and it will inform you whether an eclipse of the sun was visible in that region that particular year. In some cases we can know that a comet was visible that year but an eclipse of the sun was not, which suggests that these ancient authors would sometimes commingle historical details with portents, fictional ones. And so we wonder if Matthew could be doing the same here to lay emphasis to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died. So to accuse the author here of, of um, deceiving us, I think, is to show a naivete when it comes to the ancient literature. One more thing could be said here, and that is if they felt freedom to do this with the raised saints, the resurrection of the saints in Matthew 27, what about the resurrection of Jesus? Well, we know the way I would answer that is that we can determine that the disciples really intended for us to believe that Jesus' resurrection was a historical event. You have Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, who's basically saying, if Christ has not been raised, we will not be raised. If we will not be raised, this life is all there is. The Christian life is not worth living. Eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Get all the pleasure out of life you can because this is all there is if Christ has not been raised. But Christ has been raised, therefore we will be raised, therefore the Christian life is worth living. And that argument of Paul's makes no sense whatsoever unless he intended to convey that Jesus' resurrection was a historical event.